Good morning, Bellevue. This is Art Jarvis, your interim school superintendent. Uh, again, uh, looking forward to a, a little chat. And in this case, while we invite everyone to be of uh, interested and listen, the, the primary audience is intended for our students. And the reason I say that is that earlier this year, we had a chance to see students who came to board meetings, who came to the superintendent that went on social media talking about an issue of sexual assault and how that's uh, handled by the school district and what are forms, how they work or don't work, etc. So it's my pleasure today to reintroduce to a, a world Eva Collins, our Deputy Superintendent for Teaching and Learning. Uh, but I'd like to spend a few minutes today asking Eva to share with us both what we've learned and efforts we are making to really honor some of the requests of the of the students. So, Eva, uh, as by way of beginning this conversation, uh, what have we learned through this process? Well, thank you, Dr. Jarvis. And to our students, I'll say we are so proud of you for um, taking this issue and bringing it to light and taking action. This is an issue that's so important nationwide. It's It's garnering a lot of attention. And a lot has happened in our district um, over the past several months with our students bringing forward their own ideas on steps that we can take and what they see from their perspective as to be part of the problem and um, wanting to be part of the solution. And so what we've really learned is from our students that um, there's a lot more we need to do in terms of um, sharpening up some of our systems and in terms of how we're listening and handling uh, situations as they arise and how we're listening to our students and caring for them through the process. Well, let me, let me start with maybe a very graphic example of, of what the young people were talking about and what, what our situation is. Title IX, federal legislation, uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of, of sex and gender and is very specific in dealing with uh, complaints, for example. So the young people brought to us a complaint. They didn't like the very first question. Uh, yes. You know, what, I think it was what caused this event. Yes. And the kids found that very offensive. What do we do with that? Yes. The kids brought that to our attention. And it's actually a question that was not intended to be on our form and was not on our updated form, but was on an old form um, that was still being used in some of our schools. And um, it actually is on our state form as well. And that so that's where it came from. That's where it came from. And so we agree with them completely. And this is one of those things where I was talking about tightening up systems where we did not realize that that some of our folks were out in the field were using or on our schools were using an outdated form. And um, so we took steps to correct that. And we have communicated that in multiple ways to our administrators and to our schools to use the correct form. Here's where it is. And we've gone th um, through with a fine tooth comb to try to find all the places we can find where that old form might still be. And we're continuing to find places where that old form um, is sort of hidden. Um, and so we just appreciate people bringing that to our attention so that we can continue to. I think it's a great example of really hearing the kid's voice yep. and being able to say, but let me stay with that same piece for a minute because we we obviously have a complaint process by which somebody can file a complaint uh, and under HIB harassment intimidation and bullying and title 9 there's a there's a very confirmed process but what i watched was kids who were very confused by the fact that the complaint starts and then they don't hear anything else it just kind of disappears yeah. under the privacy rules sure. so what can we do about that what are you doing that is so tricky because we do have to and want to maintain privacy for all individuals involved in any situation. And so it becomes really tricky when um, a student raises a concern and then they're not sure what's happening behind the scenes. And so what we're working on and working with our students to develop is how can we keep kids informed without violating the privacy of other students? And that is a tricky process. What I'll also say about the HIV form the harassment, intimidation, and bullying form is that our students came to us and said, 
That's great. We need that form. And we want a separate form for sexual assault. We think it um, warrants its own form and reporting process and that there's enough difference that we think that we need a separate form. And so that has been constructed with feedback from our students as well. And then beyond the formal process and filing the complaint and investigating the complaint, uh, I know I have mentioned the, the idea of putting a face on the district, having a person who can reach out to the students uh, and and help them understand the process and, and the location. Can you talk about that, whether it's called the director of student life or something different? Right. Thank you for asking that question, Dr. Jarvis, about the director of student life. This is a new position that we're super excited to be able to implement. And we thank you for bringing this position to our district. It is new. Um, and this position is developed with students in mind completely. This position is designed around su supporting students around any issues that they want to bring forward, but um, to work as an advocate for our students and to be able to help them navigate some of these processes and systems that are really hard to navigate at times. It's someone that's not their um, administrator that they can go to and trust who will have sort of the bigger view and um, be able to support them. Not too long ago, I had a chance to listen to about 15 students, part of a student advisory group. It was online. Uh, one of the most delightful hour and a half that I have spent in my time in, in Bellevue. And we asked the kids to review some of the ideas we had and, and tell us. And, and as our young people will do in their natural sense, uh, one of the ideas that, that we had put forth was to have a specially trained counselor in each school that really understood the full process of HIV and Title IX. And pretty much all 15 kids told me, well, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> uh, but they came at it from the idea that that person wasn't necessarily the person they would feel free to talk with, uh, that they would find somebody they trusted. So comment on that a little bit of, of sure. this intent to try to provide expertise in each school, each high school, mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, understand where the kids are coming from. The kids are absolutely right, of course. And the person that they most trust might not be that one individual that would be specially trained. However, the person that they trust does need someone to go to as well, who is specially trained, who would help be able to help and guide and advise. So I would say that um, we still want to have at least one expert, perhaps more at every school that will continue to get training and to share that training and those strategies with others at the school. But um, we want all of our staff to have some training. So we are including all of our counselors, for example, and our administrators in training that's going to be happening um, this spring in April. Um, but we will, excuse me, provide deeper training for at least one individual at every school so that that person can um, have that as their one thing that they're going to make sure that they stay abreast of all of the um, changes in legislation that come down or new um, resources that may come to light, that they would be the one to be sort of the chief warrior at the school and the chief expert at the school. On that note, I want to switch to not training of adults, but the education of the kids. The 15 or 16 kids uh, told me point blank that getting this information on, for example, sexual assault and awareness in one health class at seventh grade and one health class at 10th grade is woefully inadequate. It's too late. And, and they literally demanded something better. It's a sensitive topic with families and parents uh, of when and how do you talk about something like sexual assault or touching or proper touching improper. Uh, I guess comment on that as to what you see, because what the kids were asking for is a earlier, stronger health curriculum. Doesn't even have to be in health. They, they suggest it was better dealt with in PE, matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that a little bit, if you will. Yeah, the, um, thank you for asking that, because the kids, once again, um, they have it right on it, and the state agrees with them. So in 2020, the voters and our legislators uh, passed some new legislation that will require uh, sexual health education 
starting in fourth grade through 12th grade. So you're right. It used to be just this one shot in the one semester, seventh grade or 10th grade, and um, that is not sufficient. Um, the, the health curriculum changes will start in kindergarten, but the sexual health starts in fourth grade. Um, and those topics will be covered all the way through 12th grade. And it will not be able to just be in health class because we don't offer health class in every grade level. Um, and so we are looking at our, we have a, our curriculum department, our teaching and learning department is working on that. And our students are part of that process as well. We have students working on a committee to look at our curriculum and to figure out ways that we can incorporate that and where does it make sense and what curriculum and what um, experiences do kids need. Our kids also talked about the vocabulary that's used in some of the curriculum and that it's just not effective and they have better ideas on how we can get some of these um, concepts across, especially at a um, developmentally appropriate um, at the different grade levels. Thank you, Eva. And we promised to try to keep these short enough that people will stay with us. Uh, but I think I would conclude with one of the things that's typically missing in a lot of decision making is student voice. Period. We recognize that. In this particular example of students coming forth with their pretty much demanding to be heard, uh, thoughtful discussion about what the topic was, us trying to find ways to be able to respond. I'm really pretty proud as I sit here of the work that you're doing and the others are doing to to find better avenues for the that that really affects in such a deep way the, the lives of these kids and uh, and dealing with tough topics such as sexual assault and uh, sexual harassment and things that happen to kids in in our schools and how can we help them as a school district so on that note, I would just say thank you for tuning in. Stay tuned because you'll see changes and responses in the school district. Thank you.